Hey everyone, I'm Ben Yeo and today I'm having a conversation with the most amazing author, Rebecca Giggs. Uh, Rebecca has published her first book, Fathom, The World in the Well, and it's already prize winning. Her essays and writing have been in The Atlantic, Granta, The New York Times Magazine, and she's just simply awesome. Uh, her recent work has featured our relationship with animals in a time of both technological change and ecological crisis. So Rebecca, truly welcome. And I think we're going to start off with a short uh, reading from your book. So please take it away. Thank you, Ben. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit. This is the, I should show the cover. This is a beautiful, it's a little glary, I think, in the light. British hardback. Um, appropriately, it looks like it's covered in... Um, cling film, which seems kind of hygienic for this uh, this moment in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I'm just going to read from the preface um, for about three or four minutes. And this is a scene that has to do with the decomposition of a whale's body when it dies out in the open ocean and starts to fall down into the deep sea. A dead whale slips below the depth where epipelagic foragers can feed from it. The whale's mushy body decelerates as it drops, and where pressure compounds, putrefying gases build up in its softening tissues. It drifts past fish that no longer look like anything that we might call fish, but resemble instead bottled fireworks, reticulated rigging, and musical instruments turned inside out. The whale enters the abyssopelagic zone. No light has ever shone here for so long as the world has had water. Entering permanent darkness, it passes beyond the range of diurnal time. Purblind hagfish slink, jawless, pale as the liberated internal organs of other animals. Jellyfish tie themselves into knots. The only sound is the scrunch of unseen brittle stars eating one another alive. And slowly, it is very cold. Hell's gelid analogue on Earth. The hagfish rise to meet the carcass and they tunnel in, lathering the passages they make with mucus. They absorb nutrients right through their skin. The whale body reaches a point where the buoyancy of its meat and organs is tethered by the force of its falling bones. Methane is released in minuscule bubbles. The ballooning mass scatters skin and sodden flesh below it, upon which grows a carpet of white worms waving upwards, like grass on a grave. Then, sometimes, the entire whale skeleton will suddenly through the cloud of its carcass. For a time, the skeleton may say, stay hitched to its parachute of muscle, a macabre marionette, jinking at the spine in the slight currents. Later, it drops, falling quickly to the seafloor and into the plush cemetery of the worms. Gusts of billowing silt roll away. All of the whale's pulpier part settles over it, and marine snow Anonymous matter that's being ground down to grit in the sun-filtered layers of the sea sprinkles down ceaselessly. The body is likely to settle far deeper than any living whale will ever descend to see it. Now rat tails, sea scuds, more polychaetes and eel pouts appear. Nobody knows from where. Opportunist octopuses bunt between rib ribs and sightless whiskered troglodytes like ginger tubers burrow into the surrounding sediment, which is blackened with fat and whale oil. From the dark come red streamer creatures that flutter all over, colorless crabs, their delicate gluttony. Life pops. It's as though the whale were a piñata, cracked open, flinging bright treasures. In a time, the remaining bones of the dead whale on the seafloor are stripped and hot, and then they fluff up with flounces of silver white bacteria so that it appears as if the skeleton is draped in meters of downy toweling. There the bones stay, lashed softly by microbes. Decades may pass, a hundred years even, before nothing remains. 
only a dent that holds the dark darker. That was beautiful uh, and covers like in a microcosm so much about your book. Uh, and that also has led to my first thought is your writing is really beautiful and you have these really glorious uh, sentences. Uh, do you concentrate on the sentence and kind of edit as you go along? Uh, do, you th do you think of the beauty of your, of your writing, particularly sort of in book form, as opposed to sort of essays or, or journalism? Or is that kind of a natural way you kind of think about this type of writing? When I started the book, I had an idea that it would be very straight science communication. So it would literally just be a book about the ways in which the lives of whales today reflect the anthropogenic change in the oceans. And if you go to the science section of your bookstores, you'll tend to find these kinds of books. There are um, some are about physics, some about mathematics, some about biology. But the purpose of science communication is really to provide a kind of lucid, cl clear description of a complex set of scientific findings. And so the tendency is to use quite direct and conversational language. And so I struggled on with that idea for, I suppose, the first 10 months of this project. And then there was one day, um, really blindingly hot day in Sydney. Um, there'd been a heat wave. My little apartment was stultifyingly hot. And so I went to the local library um, and I was sitting downstairs in the state library uh, in the air conditioning and a friend of mine who is a poet um, just by coincidence and he sat on the table next to me and we kind of had a chat and then we got back to our respective work and I just thought to myself you know what I, just for today you know given the fortuity of this I'm going to try to write the science in the way that Aidan Rolf, my, my poet friend, would write the science. And I wrote that passage, which was the, the, the decomposition of the whale. Um, and I tried to really embody his voice on the page. And once I had that, I really understood actually that what I was writing was not just a science communication book, but though it's kind of science literate and science curious, it's very invested in the question of how do we represent the natural world? What are the narratives that we mobilize um, in, within our culture when we encounter the science? And what are the kinds of lyricism and, you know, language traditions that come out of our attachment with nature? Um, so, yeah, so that, that sequence really became the engine that then pushed into the rest of the project because, you know, whereas I had seen the death of a whale as a tragedy of course in the deep sea it's kind of like spring comes you know like all these organisms just leap up all of this resource yeah exactly it's a big energy input and it's a turning point it's it's suddenly this huge act of fecundity and um and that kind of like swivel from the tragedy to you know the new beginning kind of became a motif for the rest of the book that's amazing. So uh, another thing I think about your book, which is quite unique, it, it kind of harkens to that because it doesn't strike me as science communication. You know, it's, it's science curious, like you say, I, but I wouldn't put it next to kind of climate change for dummies or, or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that in, in the bookstore. And there's, there's a tradition, I guess, of, of nature writing. You know, you have people who go on for walks, people who consider mountains. You know, there's a little bit of, of that. But you also have, I guess, a, a lot of this, you've used it, there's a sort of a, a narrative, there's almost a memoir uh, element to that. So I could place it within that tradition. On the other hand, there's also a few books which are almost like history or a lens of history where you look at the world through something. So you, you look at it through the lens of a building or the lens of a geography or the lens of an empire or the lens of an item like salt or the seas or trade. And we, we see the lens of humanity through uh, through whale, through whales, through whaling, which was really uh, fascinating. So I was just wondering, did, did you are you conscious of those traditions and things or when you sort of worked out or as it comes later? Or do you place it with that? Or do you, do you think I just have this and this is this is the form and way I thought that would best express the kind of story or narrative that you're thinking about? 
Yeah, I mean, when I started, I'd never written any narrative nonfiction before. I'd written short fiction and a couple of review essays, quite long essays. But um, this was my first, <laughs> my first like uh, foray into this world, and I probably, with hindsight, should have bitten off something slightly smaller than the whale and the world. But um, nonetheless. Yeah, yes, exactly. So when I started out, yeah, when I was stuck, a friend of mine gave me a piece of advice that I really just needed to write short sections, literally as long as would fit under the palm of your hand. And he suggested that I work with this model of decomposing the whale. So, um, you know, taking all of the elements of the whale from um, its lungs and the way that it inhales airborne pollutants to its blubber and the absorption of heavy metals that takes place as a result of organic phosphate runoff in the ocean to um, the baleens that are in the whale's mouth, which is kind of like a um, mustache that's kind of inside the top lip of some whales, which they use to feed with. And those baleens have been used historically um, in the 19th century. They were kind of like the thermoplastic of the time they were taken out and remolded into all kinds of different products. And so I started with this sort of act of decomposition and making these very short pieces all focused on a different body part of the whale. Um, and also as I was going along looking for the evidence of human contact, um, you know, there, there's some amazing stories of like um, very ancient Arctic weaponry in the forms of arrowheads being embedded into the flesh of living whales because they were um, speared but not killed when they were young. And then um, those whales can go on to live 200 years. And then when they eventually die and they're studied by scientists, we find these artifacts of human culture um, uh, that are museum worthy and, and very important for historical reasons actually in the flesh of these animals. And then of course there's all the plastic in his stomach as well. But at any length, I had this decomposition and then as I got along with the book, I started reading a lot more natural history, um, particularly in that Eurocentric tradition that you're talking about. Um, and yeah, I think you can locate some motifs in Fathoms that are consistent with that history. Um, but there were some things that I wanted to push back on as well. Um, you know, that, that nature writing tradition comes out of a period of time in which nature was set up to be a place of retreat from urban modernity and it was supposed to be reassuringly refreshing and almost kind of, our playground in some way. A playground, but also like a source of moral instruction. You, you could go there and kind of have an encounter with the godly and, um, uh, and it was always, you know, it's always white able-bodied men in this in this narrative and so you, you get from this a lot of adventuring narratives a lot of sort of um traditions of of kind of greeting um uh grand large nature at scale um uh in a kind of vigorous um expeditioning and so there's one chapter in the book um which is actually about digital culture and about experiencing the whale from within a crowd, you know, particularly within an online crowd. What does it mean to share photographs of, of whales online, um, whales and dolphins? And I wanted that to be there because I wanted to write from collectives, you know, like I wanted to write from collective experiences of nature. And I also wanted to acknowledge that it's not just about the nature that's kind of in the deep sea or in American national parks or European alpine ranges, it's also, you know what what we do in our kitchens matter what what we do in our kind of back gardens and how we drive and you know our work it's all relevant to what nature is today and so is the digital sphere anyway yeah. long, i think long... we're going to we're going to touch on that individual and system but one thing i'm going to pick up which is really fascinating which is your idea of decomposition because it's a very strong sort of theme through that and i think that's amazing because Essentially, it sort of means that your structure and form follow your process and the process of the well and everything, and it reflects one another in a, in a really satisfying way, both structurally and form, married with, with the writing uh, and the education and, and the science and everything. 
and I think that's one other interesting about the lens of the whale of viewing the human part of the relationship. And you make quite a strong line of argument for how whale was essentially one of the first ex extractive industries. Uh, and l like you say that, and that actually the whole life cycle of the whale that we're seeing now, like you say, we've em embodied so much of humanity within it, whether it's chemicals or our ancient past or how it, how it absorbs. Uh, do you think we, uh, I guess with this idea of extractive, do you, do you think we probably haven't learned enough about how we, uh, how we did use the whales or the extractive as a kind of an extractive industry. And I guess that also ties into uh, the successes or, or not of some of the green movement. Uh, I, I've leapt far too far ahead, but I guess it's just interestingly seeing, um, you know, do you, do you think we did use it essentially as an, an extractive industry before we really understood what we were doing? Yeah, well, I think the research, the, the way to answer that question, I suppose, is to take you a little bit on the research journey of this book, which was that I thought, as I believe many people do, that whaling was an artifact of the 19th century. You know, my, my picture of whaling was like, it's it's the Victorian era, it's the same time as like, people were applying leeches to their bodies for medicine, and there were seances and smelling salts, and that is where I had parked whaling in my mind. And though I had heard, of course, about the 1980s Save the Whale campaigns, because I was born in the mid 1980s, I sort of vaguely conscious of that green movement. But I understood whaling to have tailed off well before that. As it turns out, that's not the case. Many people attribute, um, you know, believe that whaling declined because of some invisible hand of the market that came in um, with things like kerosene and petroleum and thermoplastic and essentially replaced the robotic the products that whales were being used for. So in the 19th century, to take a step back, whales were exploited for their oil and for their baleens. We talked about their baleens a minute ago, um, these, these bristly mouth substance that was used as a kind of, um, well, it was used in everything from surgical stitching to, you know, it was molded into hula hoops and police battens. And I don't know if you have this expression in Britain, but to wail on somebody. Do you have yeah, that? Yeah, we do have little. Yeah, so that's from the canes that used to be used in schools as corporal punishment for children. Um, they were made literally from this baleen substance, the fibre. Um, uh, so we whale on somebody to hurt somebody is to, is to cane them with literally a piece of whale. Um, and then the oil, the oil really was part of the late industrial revolution. It was a lubricant in machinery. Um, it was used in textile factories, but most importantly, it was an amazing illuminant. It went into lamps and candles. And that didn't just like, it wasn't just an industrial product. It changed the conditions of production because once you had a reliable long burning illuminant, factory hours could be extended, shop floor hours could be extended. Um, you know, it, it had a huge influence on not just the speed of automation, but um, yeah, the way the economy worked at large. Um, then we jump forward to the 21st century. You think, well, here are all these other cheaper substances that are going to replace whaling. That didn't happen. What ended up happening was the products that whale oil went into changed. They became a different market. They became luxury goods. They got affiliated with the space race, which is a bizarre talk on the sort of history of, of whale substances. They ended up in the tiny little shutters that are on satellite cameras. Um, and, uh, you know, the proponents of the whale oil business really went to great lengths to get them into soap um, and into margarine as well. So it was really a cornerstone of new hygiene practices and, and the diet, the working class diet. Um, but ultimately, you know, we we needed cultural change to affect economic change in this area because fossil fuels meant that we could exploit whales to a far greater degree. We could pursue them with faster ships. We had refrigeration on those ships. We could obtain species of whales that were much larger and hadn't been hunted in the 19th century because we had big mechanical boats. Um, and so there was a kind of whaling Olympics. There was a surge in the 60s um, of whale hunting 
um, by a lot of, you know, major Western nations. Um, and so there's this lesson where I think, you know, we did need a kind of collective cultural change to enforce that that pivot. Um, yeah. Yeah, I actually think that's one of the things that they teach very initially in economics and then you forget is that markets and products are actually very social things, right? They are they are governed by us. And even when you have supposedly unregulated markets, there are actually there are laws, either social norms or not, for, for what govern them. I, I was very struck by your research and writing into this about how essentially quotas failed because they said, oh, we're going to do quotas. And then you had overwhaling as people tried to, essentially they ended up decimating the world population to mm. try and get in before the quotas. And then you had this huge excess surplus that you either needed to go almost full ban, which is kind of where you went, where you have that. So these are kind of unintended consequences. But to your point, it really was only solved from some of the social and demand change, which went, uh, which went alongside that. Yeah. Uh, the other theme on that, which really rung, rung with me was that it also charts not only the history of hum, humans and the ecological crisis and the technological change, but it, kind of the smaller lens about the, the history of kind of, I guess, activism, where where whales are kind of seen as a symbol of activist uh, success. But mm. actually, in your research and your writing, it, it seems to be much more complicated than that, actually, that what, what happened. And actually, whales also reflect the um, models of activism change and actually change through our lifetime. What what did you find there? And you, you, you touch on it uh, a few times. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's common to look back now and view those anti-whaling campaigns as effectively benevolent animal welfare campaigns, whereas in actual fact, they fit more neatly into a model of dealing with globalised environmental problems. So this, you have to remember, is an era in which, you know, the, the ozone layer is becoming very topical. Um, Chernobyl is only just in the rear vision mirror. So that idea of kind of cross-border radioactivity um, is a concern. The acid rain clouds in some parts of Europe are similarly multi-nation, multi-state problems. And saving the high seas, you know, like having, having some kind of connection to the planetary dimensions of the wider ocean was hard until we had a global animal like the whale to empathize with. And I think about this a lot in terms of that question of how do you tell global stories now? Because for myself, you know, when I hear about the melting ice caps or I hear about levels of CO2 in, um, you know, the atmosphere worldwide, it uh, activates for me sadness and um, and grief, but it, it's also the dimensions of it are kind of too big to wrap my head around. I find it very bodiless, like it's it's very sort of hard to empathise with the changing biosphere on that vast level. Whereas, you know, in the early part of this book, I describe a whale beaching um, in Western Australia, in Perth, where I'm from. And when I went right down to see this, this beached whale and there were all these people standing around, this kind of like macabre carnival atmosphere, all these families with their children and some people brought their pets down. But there was an attitude that was a bit like, um, at last, you know, here is the body. Like here is, we knew there was trouble we knew things were changing in the ocean. We, we maybe heard vaguely about acid in acidification or plastic pollution, but we lack the kind of sensory apparatus to apprehend it. We can't taste the ocean's acidity and we rarely, unless we go to the big plastic guys, actually encounter the dimensions of, you know, microplastic and plastic pollution at its extremes. And so the arrival of a whale on the beachfront had this kind of mood of, um, you know, he, here is the body to mourn. Here is the event that kind of gives flesh to our environmental conscience. Um, so, yes, I've, I've wandered off topic here, but uh, the, the activism of the 80s around whales was very much about a globalised environmental citizenry. Um, it was intended to be about protecting things that you would never encounter 
um, you know, you could feel for the whale, even if you lived in a high rise building in an urban environment, it mattered to you that the planet wasn't denuded of its largest animals. And I think that question of like having empathy and compassion for the unmet thing is really sharp in this point in time, because we are going to be called to care for things in the future that we don't have either a genetic connection to. It's not about our families. They're not part of our tribe. You know, we're going to have to care for people who live very far away from us. We're going to have to care for environments like the polar environments that are un totally uninhabited. Um, and I guess I wanted to revisit that that moment in the 80s where it was possible to um, feel meaningfully engaged with the planetary. And you touch a lot about that, seeing the lens of, I guess, the system through the individual. Well, you see it through the whale, you see it through individual's experience and that chapter about about the digital. Do, do you see much conflict between that individual lens and I guess a lot of individualism which, which has gone through uh, the last uh, decade or, or two versus how we are going to have to cope with this systemic change and dealing with these other entities, whether that's environment or people or far away, distant, both time and geography and and otherness. It, it, that seems to be coming together in, in sort of sharp relief. And I, I think your writing reflects that and you have some very interesting chapters on that. Uh, do you think that's a conflict which resolves through this? Are we, are we going to see it, continue to have to see it through this individual lens? That's a great question. And I don't know that I've got a definitive answer on that. I, I, you know, I think that... You'd be running for president maybe yes. if you did. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the narrative is, you know, this is always my um, instinct. And it may just be that, you know, what 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 I have is is writing right I, I don't I'm no good with spreadsheets I'm no good with like other other you know my ta my talents lie here so I'm perhaps like prone to um uh read this as salient um and that is that it it really is about people's connection to narrative that um activates their environmental conscience um I think you know when a whale washes up and it's you know I at the beginning of the book I talk about this particular whale that washes up near Spain um, off the coast of Spain and it has in its stomach this like stupendous medley of objects it has um, bits of bedding coat hangers wires it has most saliently an entire greenhouse that has been collapsed and it contains within it ropes and tarpaulins um, uh, and it's come out of the um, Almeria warehouse um greenhouse district which is effectively like the salad bowl of europe where all of your tesco's tomatoes and you know salad leaves are, are um, grown over the winter um and i think i read that news story and i thought to myself if i had put that in a novel people would not believe it yeah. because here you have you know the 1980s fantasy <laughs> yeah paragon of you know, green devotion in the 80s, the whale, and it's consuming literally the metaphor of our climate crisis. The greenhouse is how we talk about global warming. Um, and that kind of like encapsulation of history and plastic and all these kind of issues, it really sung out to me as being important because we have these stories in our culture already about what it means when a whale washes up with someone inside it. So, you know, if if it's Leviathan or it's, you know, lots of different cultures have these narratives of someone being swallowed by a whale and then undergoing a kind of moral turnabout. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it matters to us. It sets up this kind of beacon of awareness when things like that happen in the real world. Um, and that's not really an answer to your question of, you know, how do we balance this system's um, awareness with, individual solipsism or individual kind of but it's a reflection on how it yeah. was and how how it is and how it's been that for that for some time in fact so we've been speaking and david finnegan has said a lot of playmaking or writing today is all you know do you make art in a time of climate crisis that actually all art is somehow uh, related to that because it's a reflection of where we are in a change but on reading your book, I kind of reflected that actually it's been like that 
for decades or if not centuries. And I would also add that other part that you reflect on is the technological change. So that actually, in some ways, all our writing, our reflection, our humanity and our art has reflected ecological crisis, ecological change, technological change mm. um, uh, as well on that. But do you think there's, I guess, any particular, go on. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that there are the mental models of the technological world are very, they, they're kindred with the ecological conscience too. Like my students, I used to teach creative writing at a university and we would talk about nature writing. And my students would come to me and say, gosh, I, I can't name the trees. Like, I don't know the names of this eucalypt versus that. I look out into the world and I think I, these things are completely nameless. But because they were so embedded in the technological realm, because they had an understanding of feedback loops and, you know, they, they had an understanding of networks and a cybernetic consciousness, ecology came very easy to them in the sense that they understood systems. And I think actually a lot of nature writing craves a kind of specialised language of terminology, giving everything the right name, whereas I am very hopeful about the next generation that though they may not have that, what they have is a, a much more technical systems based way of thinking. Well, I think we're definitely seeing progress, right? We do, you know, there's some things which gets worse, but there are a lot of things which also, which also do get better. Yeah. Okay. I thought we might do now a little section of a kind of overrated, underrated, uh, if you're up for that, uh, but it'd be a kind of overrated, underrated um, animal edition. Uh, which I, I thought we'd do, so we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, you can pass on anything or not, but um, uh, I would thought, so overrated, underrated, mm. uh, snails. Oh, underrated. Yeah, so we've had a pet snail, quite a famous snail. Tell me about snails. Why are they underrated? <laughs> we acquired um, some snails after my partner David was scheduled to do a performance in London in the middle of the year and when it was cancelled um you know the, the everything got wrapped up and what have you but we still had these props from the performance which were these living snails um uh, and I think you know we had to care for them over those first few months of the lockdown and um they're they're kind of magic little animals they're um you know they're they're incredibly vulnerable they're soft on the underside and yet they've got this like shell they can retreat into and they were a nice little metaphor i think in the moment of lockdown of feeling both like Maybe hard on the outside yes penny and <laughs> and sensitive they've got, they've got identity gender fluidity type Absolutely. things going through them great okay snails definitely underrated underrated okay so uh this might be one more for a uk audience who might not know this although australians that but uh chicadas underrated overrated and are uh, you know they're kind of more prevalent than you might think right at certain times of the year yes it's we're going through an eight year once every eight year boom of green grocer cicadas in australia at the moment in new south wales which means that if i have to zoom somebody out in the blue mountains you know how the frame moves with the sound it just doesn't move off the person who's in new south wales because the, the background sound of these cicadas i think the scientist i was talking to the other day said he measured 95 decibels, like literally the sound of a jackhammer within 20 meters. That was the level of sound coming from this once every eight year boom in, in greengrocer cicadas. Yeah. Yeah. Very surprising sound. Like actually the sound of people haven't heard the sound of koala also very, very surprising. Yeah. Okay. The Brits think a koala is cute. I can only think it's because you've never heard one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they make a horrible noise. They're, they're yeah. terrifying. If you, in, if you're camping, and you hear them fighting, it's like listening to gargoyles, you know, go at each other. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So maybe ko koala cuteness overrated once once you truly get to know them. Um, okay, uh, so worms, overrated, underrated? Underrated. I mean, they do so much amazing work. And I read somewhere the other day that they can have eight hearts. I eight didn't know that eight hearts in the one body I don't know if that's true but I, I read it in a in a poem <laughs> um, yeah so so full of heart the other yeah. yeah I think completely underrated and actually also extremely useful for for science as well as the fact that they do yeah. do so much for us okay and then um, have you read the Ted Hughes short story about um, the worm the origin of the worm 
It's like a beautiful short story. He talks about God oh, having right. made the elephant with clay. And then at the very end, he kind of rubs his hands together to get rid of the last little bits of clay that are on his hands. And, and he makes these tiny little filaments and he just molds one into a tiny elephant trunk and he drops it and forgets it. And so earthworms are the elephant trunks, like these tiny little elephant trunks, just trying to find more clay <laughs> to make themselves whole. Um, it's a lovely story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. OK, no, I, I'm going to go and read that as well. OK, and we'll do our final our final one here um, is uh, plankton or maybe particularly a phytoplankton. Uh, not an animal, I believe. No, you <laughs> are, yeah, you called me out on that. So <laughs> not a, quite an animal, but we'll, we'll stick with living being, living thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, underrated as well. I feel I'm, I'm, maybe I just love the animal world too much. But um, yeah, I mean, plankton is um, often overlooked in its ability to absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere. We, we think a lot about forests as being part of, you know, the climate system and trees offsetting, um, you know, our, our carbon emissions, um, which is why reforestation or preserving old growth forest is such a flashpoint issue. But plankton in the ocean is responsible for an even larger proportion of absorption of CO2 to the point where I think one of the, an IMF report that I was reading a little while back said something like an uptick of plankton of 1% would be the equivalent of adding 2 billion mature trees into the system and you think how long it takes the tree to grow that's yeah that's huge so we should all care more about yeah, the any little yeah. ocean well, plants mm. thanks for thanks for playing overrated underrated on that the the living uh, the living being edition <laughs> um, turning back to your uh, book for our kind of final couple of questions mm -hmm. i guess the, because you had this pivotal moment and you talk about this, you know, of the well and the beaching, which kind of uh, was one of the genesis moments for thinking about the book and pivotal poems of writing. Do you think you wrote with a kind of, I guess, purpose of the of the book or what people you might like to think get out of it? Or kind of is it one of those things where you kind of felt compelled to write it and it just kind of wrote itself in a way and you came up with it? And then it's like I wrote it for its sake and actually now it's taking on a, a kind of life of its own. I think um, there are two questions there. There's kind of like my attachment to the project, you know, now and when I started. And then there's also a question about what kind of activism underlies the book. Like, what do I hope people will change or their mind about or take from the book? Um, so in answer to the latter, like I deliberately hold back from prescribing a specific set of actions. If people feel um you know activated by this book the energized by this book to go and care more for the oceans um there's nothing in there that says well you need to these are the steps you know you need to do x y and z although there are suggestions in there and the reason i didn't set out to prescribe something you know so so kind of um didactically is that i think each of us needs to start where we are um, and each of us has a different set of privileges, a different set of resources, a different network um, that we can leverage. So I always say, you know, when I talk to students about the book, that it starts with taking a bit of an accounting of what you have in front of you and also what you're good at. Like what, what is the one thing that you have that you're uniquely good at um, that you could bring to this cause? So maybe you are the spreadsheet queen. Yeah. And maybe, and in which case, you know, maybe you can find an hour yeah. or two to... Numbers will save the world, yeah. <laughs> to, to kind of give to an NGO to do their books or to... Um, but it also means engaging people on the other side as well. You can't just talk to your community. You need to be ready to generously um, engage with people who, who think otherwise. Um, and then there's a the question of, like, what what kind of my <laughs> experience was, I think I started out feeling like questions of trans hemispheric ocean pollution and climate change were, um, I felt hum humiliated by them. I felt like they made me um, disempowered. They made me full of grief. Um, but I think my biggest takeaway is the fact that, um, you know, these problems are occurring on such a scale um, means that we have a capacity to make change on that scale as well. You know, like we can individually change our consumption patterns in small ways 
and it can have an effect all the way out in the deep sea and that's sort of stupefying as well um so now i i often you know i used to if i picked up a product off um the supermarket shelf sometimes i would think oh i wonder how much water has gone into creating this pro product or i wonder how much pollution has been caused in manufacturing this product now i also think much more downstream i think much more about where the packaging is going to end up you know is it going to end up in the sea um uh, i'm more conscious of that sort of like legacy the other direction into the future as well as the past um but yeah yeah it was a journey <laughs> that is one of the things we are both distant yet actually very interconnected mm. and you make that theme both digital and, line, and distance and time and you know genetics is like well actually we've got uh, genetics in common with a lot more people you know maybe a tiny bit than you might have than many might have thought and actually there's this question I was, I was puzzling it through on the physics the other day that it's very likely that we've breathed oxygen atoms or drunk water molecules that you and I have both drunk or breathed yeah. and that whales would have drunk and breathed because of the, the, the nature and the interconnectedness and because there's so many so it's kind of mm -hmm. most almost unfathomably distant and also near. Well that's it isn't it it's like if you were anti-whaling in the 80s you were against whaling nations, whaling fleets, whaling governments. If you're anti-harming whales now it knits you into a system of worldliness that's so much more vast. It's about the weather, it's about consumption, it's about many more organisms than the ones we care enough to love and call charismatic animals. It's also about plankton. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, model of um, worldliness that we, yeah, I, th I think it can be sort of revelatory to, to come into that headspace. It doesn't need to be hum humiliating. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Great. OK, and finished up with a question about, I guess, writing now and, and maybe your uh, kind of your work day. So, you know, some writers, you know, really good. This is not me, but, you know, they get up or this is like the CEOs, right? They get up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., <laughs> write for two or three hours, chuck out 1,000, 2,000 words. And hey, look, 200 days later, I have I have my next uh, masterpiece. Um, I think uh, what was it? One of the uh, the the person who wrote the Barchester series or whatever was a postman who wrote all of his writing in three hours and and then was done so I don't know what is your uh, uh and and of course there's no one solution I love reading these and then think of oh like yeah that could never be me and it never really works but um yeah do you have any sort of thoughts about how how your writing process works or how even how your day is yeah. now or that or anything you kind of think like yeah that really works for me in terms of of being productive or not in a, in the time that we're speaking now um, well, this book took me six years to write, um, and I took I had a I had a full time job for about four of those years. Otherwise, I was working part time. Um, but I also took two six month breaks, and I think I needed those breaks to really grow some emotional conscience around what I was making and why it mattered. Um, yeah, so it it was a long project, but it also needed downtime. Uh, you know, cumulatively of a year before it was ready to go. Um, my day-to-day -day work when I'm just writing and I haven't got anything else on my dance card is literally, it's two one and a half hour bursts. So it is a three hour burst of writing and that that's no other distractions. That's just me in the Word document um, laying down, you know. Do you, whatever. do you switch off internet, door is closed? Yeah, I have a I have an old fashioned egg timer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, works. <laughs> that that um I use. I think that that's and there are different kinds of hacks along the way. When I'm really stuck and on an idea, I'll sometimes change the tools that I'm using. So I'll use a mechanical keyboard rather than my um you know like a gamer's keyboard. Yeah, uh, look. Uh, oh, you have one. Oh, and look. <laughs> They're such a look delight. at that. I got keyboard <laughs> and like. And then also, yeah, just ch changing the medium. Changing the medium, big time. And I think that the keyboard thing just makes me feel more productive when I'm sort of, makes you feel like an old fashioned kind of yeah. taking transcription or something. Um, so I'll sometimes change the tools. I don't do a lot of handwriting, um, which I know some of my peers do a lot. Um, keep a but notebook? yeah. Do you keep Sorry? a notebook with you? A notebook? Yeah, or, I do. Your journal or anything? Yeah, I don't journal as routinely as 
some friends and colleagues do. But um, I keep a notebook. What else do I keep? But it's very small. I, I sort of have two. I have one that's sort of ideas for nonfiction and then I loosely have this one that's about about fiction, although it's been a long time since I wrote fiction. Um, yeah, so I keep two notebooks with me. I also take notes on my phone if I'm out, you know, just using the notes app. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. and then when That's I'm writing, like terms actually, on notes, on note, on particularly on the note format. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I also, if I'm into something that's longer, like an article or a, potentially a book chapter, I have something that's just loosely called a research memo that sits on top of the chapter or the essay like a long sticky pad yeah yeah it's just a cover page for the document but that it's a sort of living document and it will include questions like you know what do i need to know to write this what does the reader need to know so for example if i'm writing about you know the industrial history of whaling i'm going to need to know a lot more than actually ends up in the chapter um and so I may need to know things about the chemical composition of blubber, like to quite a fine degree, um, fine, fine detailed level. Um, but then the reader is just going to need to be reminded of exactly what blubber is. Oh. Like mo mo most people know what blubber is, but they sort of, you just need to sort of let them remind them that this is, it's this fatty kind of envelope around the animal. Um, and so I have this sort of research memo that, that's outlining what I need to know, what the reader needs to know. And I keep coming back to that um as a kind of not an outline exactly but but a kind of mission statement for the for the work at large um and it becomes a piece of scaffolding that eventually gets pulled down but that's been very helpful as well great uh, that's really fascinating thanks for uh, those insights <laughs> so your book's available us now the uk already uh, already australia <laughs> obviously you can get it from amazon and online and all of that uh, but a lot of us also supporting independent bookshops because uh, that's where, you know, a lot of interesting stuff happens. Is there any uh, couple of independent bookshops you'd, you'd recommend people might look out? They also take online and post orders as well if you if you want to support yeah. them. So, well, although, you know, I'm not going to diss Amazon. We all use it as well. So wherever you're going to get it, first of all, get the book. But if you, you know, minded to, you might want to support uh, an independent bookshop. Yeah, well, um, I will recommend there's a new um conglomerate kind of interface called bookshop.org UK um, which is literally now all the independents have come together to use the one digital platform to sell um, uh, and it means that whatever you're whatever you're buying off that site you're buying to support a local retailer um, so that's the easiest kind of way to go if that's your um, if you're not uh, already familiar with a local bookstore um, I mean, in East London, we have we have some fantastic bookstores um, down in Broadway near London Fields and in Brick Lane. Um, but of course, they're all shut up shop at this point in time. So um, you can still, I think, call and they'll give you recommendations, in fact. Um, and, they, you know, people are biking around books <laughs> to their local suburbs at this point, which is really lovely. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think those bookstores are really cornerstones of literary community um, and where you can support them, they're doing it tough at this point. So um, yeah, it's it's well worth reaching out to your local um, and putting in a phone call and having a chat with a human being. <laughs> Great. Okay, so book is available, Fathoms, The World in the Well. It's prize winning. I'm sure it's gonna win uh, a lot more awards. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining me in conversation. Thank you so uh, much, Ben. Thank you. Bye. Bye.